Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are around the world. Thank you for joining us for this HKIAC webinar series, Virtual Hearings, How Best to Proceed, HKIAC Insights, and insights from our technology providers and arbitrators. I'm very, very excited today to be joined by some of the foremost experts in virtual hearings and arbitration uh, before you today. Uh, I will first start with introductions of the parties. My name is Eric Ng. I am Managing Counsel at the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center here in Hong Kong. Uh, with me today is uh, Neil Kaplan, CBE, an international arbitrator at Arbitration Chambers who has been engaged for over 40 years in dispute resolution as a barrister in England, a government lawyer in Hong Kong, a practicing Queen's Counsel, and a judge of the Supreme Court of Hong Kong in charge of the construction and arbitration list. Since 1995, Neil has practiced solely as an international arbitrator. I'm also very happy today to introduce Jason Woolridge, Director of E-Hearings at EPIC, who is a 25-year career providing litigation support services with clients in the United States, United Kingdom, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand. With him is Ms. Kate Wiley, who's worked for EPIC for over 13 years and is primarily responsible for client support with hard copy and electronic bundle needs and coordinating complex high volume scanning projects for disputes, investigations, and archiving. Thank you everyone for joining us today for what I imagine will be a very productive and very fruitful discussion on virtual hearings. Let me begin with HKIC's perspective and HKIC insights on virtual hearings. Now, before we get into HKIAC's experience, it is perhaps best that we talk about what a virtual hearing actually is. A virtual hearing is an extension of the functions that you would normally find in physical hearing rooms to remote participants all over the world, allowing conferences and hearings to continue uninterrupted by physical restrictions. These hearings have been used for anything from case management conferences to interlocutory hearings and submissions to full merits hearings, including witness examination and trials. Now, when we talk about a virtual hearing, most people, when they first think of a virtual hearing, will think of a video conferencing solution and think that that is all a virtual hearing requires. When in reality, when we talk about a virtual hearing, we are really looking at approximately three elements. One, a video conferencing or telepresence solution. Two, an electronic presentation of evidence, otherwise known as EPE, which allows for simultaneous display of documentary evidence to all participants. And thirdly, real-time transcription, which allows participants from all over the world to be able to see the transcript and see the, uh, the track, the proceedings, wherever they are. Proceeding to the first element, which is the video conferencing and telepresence uh, functions of a virtual hearing. When we talk about video conferencing and telepresence, we're typically talking about two categories of solutions. Firstly, we are looking at IP-based solutions. This is usually specific hardware, which you find in large firms and hearing centers, such as uh, those found in HKIAC. However, our experience has been that with the current COVID-19 situation, we've had to also migrate away from traditional IP-based solutions to what we call cloud-based solutions. And this uses Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams, BlueJeans, all these sorts of technologies, which I'm sure most people on this webinar today have used at some point now over the past few months. This allows for easier access for individual participants and allows for participants to take part in the proceedings no matter where they're located or what equipment they have at their location. The second element that takes, uh, forms part of virtual hearings is what we call electronic presentation of evidence or EPE. And this allows for the simultaneous display of evidence to all participants in the proceeding, regardless of where they are located. This ensures that everyone is quite literally on the same page and ensures that witnesses and arbitrators are able to see evidence at the direction of the council ensuring that the witness is seeing the exact same thing that the council wants them to see. Now, these bundles, uh, which are usually created off of electronic bundles, are operated and managed either by the parties or by a third party. Uh, in 
majority of HKIAC's experience, a third party manages the uh, operation and of the electronic presentation of evidence. However, we have had situations where parties themselves, especially when dealing with complex exhibits or evidence which requires specific expertise to navigate, such as construction drawings or blueprints, can be operated by the parties themselves. And finally, the third part of what we consider to be virtual hearings is what we call remote transcription. And this ensures that the parties have access to a live transcript regardless of location. For those of you who have taken part in physical hearings uh, for arbitration, this should not be anything new to you. But what is new is that whereas in physical hearings, the transcriber may, uh, is usually present physically with the tribunal and the parties. In a remote transcription scenario, the transcriber can either be physically with the parties or the tribunal, or can be participating from a remote location. Remote access to transcription allows the parties and the arbitrators to keep track of proceedings just like they were all in the same room. And the current systems offered by major service providers allows for annotation and notes just like transcription systems in physical hearings. Those are the elements of uh, what we consider a virtual hearing. And now that we've established that introduction, let's talk a little bit about HKIAC's experience with virtual hearings. Between April and May of 2020, 85% of all the hearings at the HKIAC were virtual in some way, shape, or form. All of the hear almost all of the hearings contained some sort of virtual component, whether that included video link and video conferencing, EPE, or remote real-time transcription. Now, there was a range, and we'll talk about this more later, but 85% of those hearings were, in fact, virtual. In addition to the actual physical, uh, actual hearings which were taking place at HKIAC, 68% of all of our hearing inquiries received by HKIAC involved virtual hearings and involved support and questions as to the availability, functionality, and assistance in how to set up a virtual hearing. Our experience has been that users are now choosing to proceed with virtual hearings instead of postponing proceedings to a later date. And in fact, we are now seeing uh, hearings which, which were originally postponed in February and March to dates in August and September and later on in 2020, now also making the decision to proceed virtually in light of the uncertain situation surrounding COVID-19. Now, I had said before that there was a range of hearings and in HKIC's experience, we consider three types of virtual hearings that we facilitate based off of our, our experience. On the, far end of the spectrum to the left, we can see what we call physical hearing plus. And these are physical hearings essentially where the parties are all in Hong Kong, but due to social distancing measures cannot all be in the same room. Large hearing room in HKIAC normally fits approximately 50 people. With social distancing in place, we can only fit about 25 people. What that means is some of the lawyers, some of the clients may have to be, participate via video link. And so with a physical hearing plus solution, the physical hearings are still held at HKIAC, but not all the parties are in fact in the same room. And some may be participating and even making submissions and cross-examination via video link instead of being physically present. On the other end of the spectrum, we have what we call full remote proceedings. And that is a situation where due to geographical restrictions or travel restrictions or simply infeasibility, parties must participate fully remotely with no party at the HKIAC or in fact in Hong Kong. HKIAC has facilitated several of these hearings where participants and each stakeholder participate fully remotely with the transcript, uh, transcription services and EPE manager also located in a uh, central location in Hong Kong. In between these two solutions, we have what we call the partial remote proceeding. And this is a hybrid of what we uh, use for physical hearing plus and full remote. This is the bulk of the hearings that HKIAC tends to facilitate. And these are virtual hearings where one or more parties in the process are participating remotely. We may have the, either the arbitrators uh, present in Hong Kong uh, in full or in part. Uh, some of the parties may be in Hong Kong, but the witnesses will not be. Some of the clients will not be. One, one or more of the arbitrators may be participating remotely. 
And so we require virtual hearing services provided by service providers such as Epic who join us today in order to facilitate those hearings so that the parties can participate without any disruption or uh, delay. Before I proceed to uh, the next page, this would be a good time to talk about HKIAC's experience, HKIAC's experience in relation to tips and tricks. Communication is paramount. Contact HKIAC as early as possible in advance of a potential virtual hearing. This allows the HKIAC and any service provider to get an advance notice of the requirements of your hearing, including geographical restrictions and anything else that may be required by the parties. Cooperation is likely important. Liaise with both the other party, all the other parties and the arbitrators as soon as possible, especially in the event that an arbitrator may disagree uh, with a suggested proposal. These solutions can be relatively complex in terms of setup, so we recommend testing sessions with the parties in advance of the hearing dates to ensure that all the chosen technologies and services are working well with all the parties. And consider backup options in the event that one or more issues may arise during the hearing. Although the technology is relatively mature, we also want to make sure that the hearings proceed without disruption. In the event that an internet failure or a platform failure may occur, have a backup ready so that the hearing can continue. And finally, some other factors to consider, use wired internet connections where possible instead of Wi-Fi, and to make sure your environment is suitable for video conferencing. Now, these are some of the tips or tricks, but just recently, HKIAC released its guidelines for virtual hearings. Released yesterday, the HKIAC guidelines collates HKIAC's experience with virtual hearings into a very practical document based off real experiences with virtual hearings at HKIAC. This addresses many of the common questions which are raised by parties or arbitrators in relation to both the feasibility and the functionality of virtual hearings and provides recommendations to ensure that the hearing can proceed as smoothly as possible with minimal disruptions or issues. Now, before we proceed to Jason and Kate from Epic in relation to their recommendations, we have a couple of polling questions for the audience in order to establish whether or not the parties in this webinar have experienced virtual hearings. You should now see on your screen a polling question for virtual hearings saying, what is your experience of virtual hearings? I have conducted a virtual hearing, it was positive. I have conducted a virtual hearing, it was negative. I have not conducted a virtual hearing. I have not had the opportunity or I have questions about doing so. We will keep the polling question up for another 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And we will end and now sharing the results. And we can see that 60% of the attendees have not conducted a virtual hearing and have not had the opportunity, but 23% uh, notably have conducted a virtual hearing and have had a positive experience. Uh, and only 3% of the attendees have had negative experiences. For those 14% of you who have questions and concerns about doing so, we hope this webinar will help answer some of those. And in the event there are further questions, we'll invite you to read the HKIC guidelines as well as the principles for remote advocacy, which Neil will talk about a little bit later. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jason and Kate at EPIC. Thank you, Eric. Um, if we can come on to the first slide, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Kate and I are going to do a bit of a tag team today. Um, uh, I guess before I before I continue, uh, welcome all from wherever you are in the world, um, whether it's morning, afternoon, or, or evening. Um, welcome on behalf of, of, of the team at Epic. Hopefully today today's session will be um, one that assists you to make the decision as to 
uh, whether an online or virtual hearing is is right for you uh, and we're not going to give you an IT lesson by any stretches of the imagination. Hopefully what we're going to cover are some of the practical um, aspects of um, making the decision or coming to a decision uh, as to whether to, to move forward with, a, with an online or virtual, virtual hearing. Um, Kate's with me today and Kate's going to be um, jumping in. So we're going to be taking uh, turns about with, with, with the slides. Now the, the, the first slide um, are things to consider. Um, and I think one thing that would be, may surprise a few people around uh, within the webinar today is that that's not overly dis dissimilar to the things that you one would need to consider for an in-person hearing. Um, other than the conferencing platform and maybe the platform management, um, everything else is fundamentally the same. Now, I hope that comes across as being fairly reassuring to, uh, to those present today. Um, conducting a, a, an online virtual hearing is not very different to conducting an in-person hearing. There are differences, obviously, but um, uh, there's been a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt out there as to uh, whether it's uh, practical to, to conduct an online hearing. And we would suggest through our experience, um, recent experience, that uh, it's certainly very much the case that, that, that one should give it serious consideration. Next slide, please. Okay, um, in advance of the online hearing, um, as with any hearing, preparation's key. Um, Eric brushed on a few of the points I'm going to bring up uh, in this next slide. Connectivity is probably the most important aspect that one needs to consider prior to conducting any uh, hearing. And I would recommend um, to all present, um, consumers of these services and providers of these services that they, um, they spend a lot of time in advance canvassing um, all of the people who may, may be uh, required to participate in the hearings in regards to their capability, the technology that they have available, internet connectivity, et cetera, et cetera. And that will, that will quickly flesh out where the deficiencies are uh, and therefore give sufficient time to, um, to the parties to resolve any issues that, that, that do arise. <clears throat> One thing that you would also need to consider um, is the type of hearing. Again, Eric brushed on the three types of hearing that, um, that HKIC offer. And again, some of the services outlined in the things to consider may not be particularly relevant for the hearing or the type of hearing that you're, uh, you're likely to conduct. So again, consider the type of hearing before uh, embarking on going, going out there to, to find real-time transcripts or document management platforms etc cetera, etc cetera. it may not be necessary for your type of hearing although it may um things to consider about time zones as well i guess this is one of the uh one of the big things that that certainly we've been hearing is uh, particularly in the arbitration space well we've got people coming in from all over the world what about time zones how do we deal with that um, and I guess there are a number of, number of answers uh, related to that. That's probably more for a tribunal than, than for, for me to, uh, uh, to give my opinion on. But uh, generally, uh, the seat of the arbitration, the, the, where the president of the arbitration is held, where the majority of the, the people who would be participating in the, in the arbitration, maybe, maybe uh, three considerations that, uh, that need to be made. Um, in terms of document displaying in advance, um, do you need a, a, a document management system? Is that essential uh, or would you require an offline um, system? Uh, would that be practical and, and, and usable for you? Uh, next slide, please, and pass over to Kate now. Thank you to the HKIAC and thank you, Jason. Um, I think really when it comes to preparing documents, this, this might be an area of question, however, Really, as has been said, it shouldn't differ very much from what you'd be considering for your normal, traditional in-person hearing. Um, the advice that we would be providing is very similar. Uh, consider right at the outset uh, the format of the bundle set, the size of the bundle set, what, um, what lends itself best to um, whether it's going to be an offline bundle, electronic bundle or online. Um, ensure you've got a clear bundle structure, perhaps more importantly for an electronic hearing, you want to have um, speed and smooth running of the proceedings. So ensure that you've established what your naming conventions are going to be uh, to be able to call those documents up for the operator and for the transcriber. And as with many bundle sets these days, there's a lot of native uh, documents that are, are best 
uh, presented in their native format. So ensure that those are um, kept in that format and uh, they can be presented um, on screen uh, as they would appear. Next slide. Um, Jason mentioned this as well. So offline electronic bundles, um, this is something where really, if you're more familiar with hard copy bundles, the offline electronic bundle is probably the, the closest um, associated electronic version. And this is something that in a traditional in-person hearing has also been provided. Uh, a hyperlinked index makes it very easy to navigate. Electronic pagination, it's as close as you can get to um, what you may be familiar with as a hard copy bundle. Um, you can highlight and annotate. Uh, the decision there with regard to an offline bundle might be, is there any need to collaborate beforehand uh, and how would you do that? Um, document to document link hyperlinking uh, in terms of the naming from openings through to the other documents. Um, and again, you can use native files, uh, Excels and, and so on. They can, they can be displayed as well. I'm going to flip over to uh, Jason now on the online bundles for, yep. um, oh, sorry, back to, the, yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks, Kate. Uh, thanks, sorry. Um, yeah, online bundles is, um, is, is really my, my area. And generally, um, the, the, the parties with the engager providers, such as Epic and others who are, who are no less like present on the call today, um, to create an online database for them. Uh, generally, that may be a cloud-based system accessible by, via a web browser. Uh, and it's a centralized repository of all of the documents um, that are required um, for the proceedings, not only um, evidentiary documents, um, arbitration documents, but also any other material that a party or the parties may wish uh, to, to put into the system that they feel would be beneficial to have in that centralized um, location. The advantages of having a, a, a cloud-based centralized repository um, are the fact that if updates to the documents that need to be made, it only needs to be made once. Um, so a little bit different to the offline system where you have multiple versions effectively of, uh, of the same information. Um, so that's, that's certainly uh, an advantage. All of the uh, annotating markup tools and features, full text searching, et cetera, et cetera, can, be, uh, can and are available in, uh, in, in an online system as well. And the, um, the cross-referencing features of an online system are similar to those that can be uh, obtained or available through an offline, um, offline system as well. Next slide, please. Okay, as we're talking about online virtual hearings, um, it's, it's probably wise to talk about the conferencing platforms um, that are available. Uh, the, the logos on the right hand side are by no means an exhaustive list of the platforms that are available uh, in the market today. But I, I guess in our experience, at least, these are the common platforms that we, uh, we come across and uh, parties talk to us about on a, on a daily basis. Um, so, well in advance of the hearing, what, what platform do you want to use? What, what platform is suitable for you? And that will depend largely on uh, the features and the functionality that you require for your hearing. Um, a lot of the platforms provide video conferencing, obviously, so we can see each other, we can talk to each other, we can hear each other. But there may be a requirement for some other features, uh, such as waiting rooms, uh, the ability for a particular moderator or a host to mute microphones, mute video, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other considerations, uh, what platforms do you use? Um, you may, you may um, come across a platform that you like, but it might not actually support um, your systems or the platforms that you use uh, as an organization. So those are considerations as well. Um, in terms of getting recommendations, obviously service providers are a good start. You may have some familiarity with your systems in-house uh, or the jurisdiction that you're working in may have uh, a system that it, it, it recommends and it, it can provide an offer uh, to you as well. Now, one of the, uh, the very important things, I, I referred to connectivity earlier, and it's important that we all establish a good connection to the system and it's reliable, robust, et cetera, et cetera. Now, 
the connectivity uh, and the reliability of the connectivity is out of our hands. There's not really a huge amount we can do about it if something goes wrong with our ISP. So what we would always recommend, and just uh, echoing uh, Eric's comments earlier, we'd always recommend you, that you investigate the option and ability to have a secondary uh, internet connection. Um, that could be in the form of a, an offline router, a, a wireless broadband router um, that you can get from your, your local telco, or even using a mobile telephone, which has wireless broadband access these days. You can tether your uh, system, your computer to your, your telephone, and you can uh, have that as a backup as well to your main, your main line. One of the things that we would also highly recommend is the use of um, a dialing access to a, a virtual hearing. Um, by having the telephone system, that offers a, a, another layer of redundancy and backup. Um, if a witness is having problems um, communicating for whatever reason, then you can ask them to dial in on the telephone and the proceedings can still uh, take place. And also, finally, um, a backup computer, tablet, you may want to have that available at, at your location just in case your, your primary system uh, falls over. And the ability for the conference platform as a whole um, to have a secondary uh, conferencing system that you can connect to in the event that your conference provider um, has a failure. Very unlikely in this day and age that, that the technology is really mature and robust, but um, uh, if you want to cover all the bases, then that, that's probably uh, an option for you. Next slide, please. Okay, agree on a protocol in advance of the proceedings. Um, how do we want the proceedings to, to, um, uh, to, to be conducted from a technology perspective? Obviously, there are procedural orders, et cetera, et cetera, to, to deal with that side of the, uh, of the equation. But in terms of a technology platform um, and a protocol, just certain things that one need, needs to consider. Do you require a moderator? Now, a moderator would be responsible for project managing and looking after the video conference platform. Uh, it's a safety blanket, if you like. If things do go wrong, uh, and they will, and they have, uh, then the moderator is there to provide guidance and assistance in order to get things up and running, away, uh, up and running again. Um, know exactly what is on offer from um, so you know exactly what is on offer from your service provider in terms of the features and functionality that you want. Make sure that they're giving you exactly what you want. Um, consider a private live stream as well. We've had experience, certainly in Australian cases, where um, the legal teams don't necessarily want to have everybody take part in the, the video conference side, including their clients. So what we, uh, we, we put on for them is a live stream. So it's a one-way um, view of what's going on in the proceedings. But the client and other interested parties that are allowed to access that can watch, um, can watch um, the proceedings without having to be actively involved. And that may be a consideration for, for some matters that, that, um, that you're working on. Uh, rules about who can be seen and heard. Uh, again, our recommendation is always for the main speakers or the main protagonists to be available to be seen and heard. Anybody else who's part of the, the session needs to have their video and audio turned off. And the simple reason for that is we only have so much real estate on our computers. We don't want 50 little boxes, thumbnail boxes with people's faces on the screen. We only want to see the main players. Um, how to deal with objections. Again, that's uh, something that we want, one should consider for a protocol. Typically in, in an in-person hearing, we would excuse the witness while the objection's being dealt with. Uh, in the virtual hearing room, some of the platforms available have the ability to break out uh, into a separate room. And therefore, you can use that facility to break out a witness into the room while the objection is being dealt with, and thereafter bring them back in once um, once the, once the the objection has been heard. Now, again, what would you, what would you do during uh, adjournment in an in person hearing? Everybody congregates together in a in a meeting room. They discuss what's been happening during the course of the previous session, etc. Again, you can use the breakout sessions within certain platforms in order to facilitate that dialogue to, to occur and um, also locking out a session and um, we'll come on to that in the privacy and security later it's important once everybody's there uh, to have the ability to lock out a session so that nobody else can uh, can can enter especially those that you don't want to enter the session um, availability breakout rooms after a session we we get many requests by uh, from our clients to make the 
the video conference last significantly longer than the sitting day so that they can break out and they can confer about the day as they would normally do in an in-person hearing. Um, also the ability to remove um, participants if required. I'm, I'm pleased to say that that's never happened in my experience, but having the ability to do that is, uh, should be considered. Um, also the ability to who, who can and cannot manage uh, the document display. Typically in hearings uh, that we cover, we have a document operator that takes care of all of the document display, but you may have um, particular witnesses that um, with complex documents, complex spreadsheets, et cetera, that you may wish to uh, have access to uh, and operate in, in, the, in the hearing. So make provision for that as well. And then finally, how to deal with interpreted witnesses. Make sure that that goes into a protocol if your hearing requires interpretation. Next slide, please. Okay, I mentioned security and privacy. It's a, it's a big a big ticket item uh, these days with certain platforms um, having uh, a lot more media uh, coverage than for, for reasons other than the platform is really good. So I think it's important just to discuss this briefly. Um, never share links publicly. I think that's an obvious one. Um, always use a session password. Force participants to register. That's an optional one, um, but you can lock it down even more by forcing the, the, registers, the, the participants to register with their domain and email. Don't allow participants to join your hearing before the host or moderator has uh, officially started the, the, the hearing. Enable a waiting room feature, which is a, which is a really a really key feature in my opinion. Um, having the ability to vet who can come into the, the session and who can't come into the session uh, is, is, is really important. Um, lock out the session, as I mentioned earlier. Ensure the moderator has control of audio and video so they can mute at any time and unmute at any time should the need arise. Um, Again, echoing Eric, consider your surroundings. Um, we are fortunate to have some wonderful uh, HKI IAC backgrounds that we've been provided with today, and they look they look really nice. So thank you very much to the, the um, HKI IAC for those. But consider your, your surroundings. Um, it, it's amazing how things are missed when you're on a video conference call that perhaps you don't really want the rest of the audience to uh, to actually see. So be, be conscious of that. Um, don't allow screen sharing by default. I think that's a given, uh, bearing in mind what's happened in recent times. Um, ensure you have the latest version of the software. Um, I'll, I'll pick on Zoom now. Um, they've they've done, uh, done tremendous things recently, um, quite rightly so, uh, in response to the criticism that they've had. And at the end of this month, they'll offer full 265-bit um, encryption uh, for their, their platform, which is uh, welcome to see. Um, and then only permit those who need to join a session to join the session. I mentioned streaming before. If, if a stream is sufficient for the purposes of, of, uh, of some of uh, the audience, then why not use the, the stream? And most of the platforms offer the ability to live stream. Next slide, please. Okay, now it's Kate's turn. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Um, I'm conscious of time, and so there's a little bit of repetition here. Um, so essentials with regard to the equipment that's required, uh, good internet, a webcam, speakerphone. Um, one of the concerns might be what is your at home screen set up and what do you have access to and how long is the duration of the, of the hearing? So obviously the ideal would be if you can have multiple screens that can display each of the transcript, the documents and the video conferencing, um, but even uh, at, at best, if you've only got a laptop, it is still possible. You can still, uh, with careful placement, you can have the transcript and the documents um, as well. But if you, if you have any difficulty or the duration of the hearing is going to be a little bit longer and you don't have the equipment, speak to your provider. They may, if they're in the same jurisdiction, they may be able to supplement uh, some equipment for you. Next slide. Um, one of the, the key points I think that Jason uh, touched on as well is test, test, test. Um, the more that you test the equipment and the software and the platform, the more comfortable everybody will feel. Um, and don't assume everything will run like clockwork. Um, you want to be able to test for volume, lighting, feedback, make sure everybody's uh, comfortable with the functionality and establish at the outset who's going to have certain control over the different functionality that's available. 
ensure you've got contacts for IT support uh, just in case anything does go wrong and have your backup plan and establish some protocols for interjecting and uh, conferring as well. Next slide. Back, back to me. Um, EP has already been discussed um, to a degree with, by Eric earlier on, so I won't, I won't dwell on, on, on this particular slide. But from my perspective, and um, for most matters that we're engaged to cover, um, the parties require um, evidence presentation performed by a document operator rather than the parties themselves. Um, it, it, having a dedicated operator, um, a professional operator that's been doing this day in day out for for a significant amount of time, will make your hearing um, proceed with greater efficiency and effectiveness. There's no doubt about it. Documents will be on the screen. Everybody within within a second or so, everybody will be on the same page. Um, there's no need to um, for any participants in the in the in the hearing to go looking for documents. Um, that's a bit of a waste of time, particularly if you you can have a, a cost-effective document operator um, at, at your disposal. Um, so that's really all, all, all I will say on EPA, Eric. So if we can just move on to the, ne the next slide, please. Which is back to Kate. Um, so with the transcript, again, really not a lot of difference between what we've experienced in an in-person hearing. Um, the discussion might be around whether or not you require a real-time transcript or a daily at the end of day transcript. So real time obviously gives you the ability to uh, make some annotations and do some searching, instant access to the, the transcript and the proceedings, the ability to search while proceedings are going on. And then afterwards, if you, if you feel there would be an advantage to have transcript and audio syncing and then uh, overlaying the annotations um, onto the final transcript. Um, that's the, the transcript's really <laughs> no different from from the norm. Okay, back to me. What, what functions of the platform can I use? Well, I think most of us have, uh, present today have in some way, shape or form had access to a, a platform such as the Zoom platform that we're on today or the Teams, WebEx, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll be familiar with the basic functionality. Um, always recommended, as I said before, if you're not an active participant, mute your audio and video. Um, there's no need for you to be seen on the screen with, with, with all due respect. Um, only the main players need to be on the screen. Um, some suggest uh, muting the council's microphone. Um, the, I guess the counter argument today is, well, how am I going to object? I need to un un unmute my microphone in order to object. And I think if you've done the testing in advance and you've got, um, you've got everybody with the right equipment, um, then the technology platforms themselves are pretty good at cancelling noise out, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly in our experience, the platforms that we've used um, all council and um, the tribunal court, etc., has um, had their microphones open. But if, for whatever reason, um, that's not the case, and, and council needs to mute themselves, just check out the features and functionality within the particular platform you're using. So, for example, Zoom has the ability to hit the space bar to open the microphone, and you can object. And then once you let go, it, it, it mutes mutes again. So, um, the the recommendation there would be spend some time with your platform, get to know the platform, get to know its ins and outs, get to know its feature set, et cetera, because um, the more you know about it, the better and more equipped you'll, you'll feel, the more confident you will feel. Um, and if anything should go wrong, um, you'll because you know the platform better, then you should be able to uh, um, resolve the, any problems quickly and easily. Um, next slide, please, Kate. Back to me. Um, interpretation, this is something that we do get asked about uh, concerns as to how does the, interpret uh, the interpreter um, interject or, or perform uh, their duty during the, the virtual hearing. Again, not really a lot of difference. Consecutive and simultaneous both have their place. Consecutive, as with a normal hearing, might take a little bit longer uh, because each sentence is relayed in the other language but it allows uh, the ability to question the accuracy of the response for anybody who's familiar with both languages. So therefore it can elongate the hearings. Simultaneous um, is still possible with uh, virtual hearings. It's possible to choose a private language uh, uh, channel within the session. 
And so therefore that allows, um, if there's a lot of uh, interpretation required for the proceedings to be kept to its minimum. However, obviously, uh, as with a in-person hearing, it doesn't allow the same ability to question the accuracy of the interpretation or the original response in, its, in their native language. Um, another consideration for simultaneous as with in-person hearings is uh, the intensity of work uh, by simultaneous interpreters means that typically they would be a, a sort of tag team of interpreters uh, throughout the day due to the, the intensity of it. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Okay, conscious of time, we, we've, we've probably taken a bit longer than we <laughs> Than we should have done. So, uh, look. In terms of general tips, we can all we can all read what's on the screen. But in essence, um, I would advise you always turn up to a session early. Make sure that the service provider you choose is, opens the uh, the virtual hearing session well in advance of the uh, actual start time. That way, everybody can join. Test that word. Test again. Test and make sure that um, everything's working as expected, so that the, the hearing can start on time and without issue. And don't share any details unless necessary. Um, Use the waiting room if uh, your your system has that, and then insist on your provider using the waiting room. Um, have a clear schedule of uh, for the hearings, breaks, lunch, etc. Um, make sure that everybody knows uh, what the schedule is going to be. Um, as I mentioned before, and I'm repeating myself, but it is it is pretty critical. Make sure you're aware of your surroundings. Uh, either use a background such as the one we have, or make sure your surroundings are clean, uh, and there's nothing uh, in the background that you wouldn't wish to be. Um, ensure everybody speaks deliberately, uh, clearly, uh, so for the benefit of all. Um, try to try to be as natural as possible, obviously, but um, it's important that, that um, you've got court reporters uh, and document operators who need to hear what's going on as well as everybody else. And the clearer you can speak, the, the better it is for them and everybody. And um, avoid over speaking if possible. I know that's quite difficult, um, but uh, avoid it if at all possible. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned again, just to repeat, ensure non-active participants have their video and audio muted. Next slide, please. And, and finally, um, there are a few pros and cons on there. Because of the time, I'll only focus on the, the last two bullet points uh, on this slide. The pros of online hearings, more effective cross-examination of, cross of witnesses. We've heard this um, surprisingly from quite a few judges. Uh, and one judge went on record from the federal court, Justice Parham, um, and he, his preference was to actually see a witness on the screen as opposed to a witness in person. Conversely, um, counsel uh, that we've been speaking with have the opposite opinion and view that they can't cross-examine or they can't potentially cross-examine cross cross the witnesses effectively uh, in a virtual environment. Uh, as they can in person. But I, I think it will be different for different people. Uh, and obviously the, 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 the status of the witness in terms of the importance of, to the case uh, may have a bearing on that as well. So thank you very much. I'm sorry we, we've over, gone over time now. No, thank you, Jason and Kate for a very, very informative uh, section on relation to virtual hearings. We'd like to turn now to Neil. As an arbitrator um, and having to deal with the current situation, uh, have you dealt with virtual hearings? And if so, what was your experience in those hearings? Well, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, it's nothing new at all because uh, over the years, we've had many cases in which a witness was not able to come to the hearing and his evidence was, or her evidence was taken um, uh, through video. So we're quite used to having video evidence. Um, nearly 20 years ago, I think during the SARS problem, I conducted a case from London where everybody else was in Hong Kong. And the time gap was seven hours and I had to get up early, but that wasn't a problem. And we did, we did it for about five days. So uh, we've got quite a lot of experience of doing that. And in recent times, uh, just a few weeks ago, I was the only one who wasn't in Hong Kong and we had a hearing in Hong Kong and the witnesses turned up, they were cross-examined, council made their submissions and we finished it all in a day and it was perfectly, uh, perfectly acceptable. So I think, I think people will get used to this if they haven't experienced it before. 
Uh, I'm very much impressed by how much better it is today than it was when we first did it. Uh, one of the problems is that some of the jurisdictions where you need to get contact have uh, less than a, a fantastic internet connection. And so we do have some problems there. But most of the time, uh, it works extremely well. And um, one of the things that I would say is that the, the use of the video hearings is, is a really good example of where the tribunal secretary comes in, because except the fact that most arbitrators are older rather than young and are less uh, capable of handling these new technologies, to have a young uh, a tribunal secretary with them who can help them understand and tra train them to use this uh, system is very helpful indeed. So I'll be very reliant upon my tribunal secretaries to get me through all this. Um, so I, I think that uh, once people have got used to it, and now they're going to have to get used to it during this particular pandemic, I think they will continue to use it uh, quite a lot because the advantages are overwhelming. I mean, just look at the amount of costs that you save. I mean, we as arbitrators do see the costs that are incurred because we have to deal with costs at the end of the day. And we are seeing huge bills of cost and travel and hotels for numbers of huge numbers of people. And I don't know how much this costs, but whatever it costs, this is a drop in the ocean. And so I think we will be we will be using more of this as we go forward, as people get more used to it, and as the systems get better and better, because all these features that we've heard about today uh, weren't always available in the old days, and now they make it very easy. Uh, council will just have to adapt, and that's one of the reasons why the Inns of Court, um, Inns of Court College of Advocacy, unfortunately, their initials are ICCA, but it's nothing to do with ICA, they put out these principles for remote advocacy, which I don't know whether you can make available, Eric, uh, for uh, all our listeners. But I think that that will give a lot of uh, hints as to how to, to handle uh, advocacy uh, in, re in real terms. I'd like to ask a question of the experts, the, uh, Jason and Kate. We understand the hearing rooms available. There's a, a limited number of hearing rooms available at any one time. I think next year, we're going to have a real problem because there won't be enough hearing rooms to take the cases that have been adjourned and the new cases that are coming up. So most of the hearing centers, I think, will find themselves pretty fully booked. Is there a limit of availability of this system? And now could you do 10 cases at the same time? Uh, how does it work? I think we would like to know something like yep. that. Okay. Um, I, I, I... I guess I can speak to the Zoom platform in, in particular, but I, I would suggest it applies equally to all of the other platforms as well. It's just a matter of licensing. So you have a particular type of uh, account. So a business account on Zoom will give you 10 concurrent hearings and each hearing can accommodate up to 300 participants. Uh, and if you want more, then you just pay for more, um, more, um, more rooms. I'm just saying that if you, if somebody, if you had 10 cases to handle tomorrow, could you handle them all through your system on the same day? We, we, we could, yes. It, it'd certainly be a challenge, I, I won't deny, but yeah, we, we absolutely could. And it, it would be easier to do it that way than it would, to do that, would be to do it in person. Yeah. So, I mean, at that point, you are running into, I mean, human resources uh, issues rather than technical problems. But uh, these, these hearings do still require administrative support. But it's easier than, uh, like Jason said, easier than having to line up 10 rooms uh, in one week. Um, I wanted to raise one point that you raised, Neil, which is that the councils will have to adapt. Uh, when we talk about adaptation, uh, one of the largest concerns from the council has been, uh, as we've heard, examination and cross-examination of witnesses. Uh, how does that differ in a virtual hearing uh, when you see the witness on screen? And uh, as a follow-up question, I guess, for Jason and Kate, what are the technical requirements that we would do to help mitigate that? Do we need multiple cameras for a witness? Uh, do we, how do we deal with cross-examination? And what do the councils have to take into account when they examine or cross-examine a witness? Uh, let's start with Neil, and then we'll go to uh, Jason and Kate on the technical uh, end of things. Let's assume that the system is functioning properly, that there's no 
terrible time gap or lag between questions and answers. And assuming that the camera is in the right position and the witness is full frontal, I really can't see uh, why there should be any objection to uh, cross-examining a witness in this, math, in this method. Um, I note what uh, Jason said about the judge who said he thought it was better from his point of view to have the witness on the full screen. He could see him exactly uh, in front of him instead of being in a witness box uh, you know, a few yards away. Even in arbitrations in the big hearing rooms at HKIC, people are not quite on top of you. So I, I, I think that if you haven't got a translation problem, uh, so there's no linguistic problem and uh, the system is working properly and you have prepared your cross-examination and you have prepared a cross-examination bundle, which you can easily give to the arbitrators and let the witness look at as well. Uh, I, I really think that uh, there shouldn't be any great difficulty. I know people will say it's not the same, but I think they'll get used to it when they try it. And a lot of the criticisms, I think, comes from people who haven't really made much use of it. Thank you, Neil. And, and then Jason, uh, what are the technical things we would have to keep in mind? Yeah, I think from a technological perspective, it, it's no different um, for a witness as it would be for any other participant, whether that be a member of the legal team or, or a member of the tribunal, depending on location they're coming in from. Um, what, we, um, what we've done uh, is we, we've probably done more testing with, with witnesses. Um, in advance of them giving the evidence. We've taken them through how the documents are going to be displayed on the screen, um, what, to, what, what they can expect. So we, we've prepared them uh, as much as we can for um, their experience. We ensure that they have a setup which is suitable in order to view the documents properly and also for them to be able to see who's asking the questions of them clearly on, on the screen. The one thing I brushed on earlier, um, which I think is key, is to have the ability to, oh, there's two things actually, to have a backup connection if possible, and also to have a, a further backup of a telephone line or a dial-in access to the hearing. And um, sometimes audio can be an issue while the video is still usable. Um, so again, in a couple of cases that we've worked on, we've still had the witness on the video but they've actually dialed in through uh, through the telephone, and that's been uh, that's worked really well. So just having those backups, I, I guess, because they are depending on where they are and where they're coming in from, they probably have less support around them than uh, the legal teams. And that's and that that's very true. And, and speaking of support, I guess that sort of leads into another question in relation to witnesses, which is. Uh, how do you prevent coaching a witness? How should a legal representative be in the room as the witness? How do you ensure that the witness is in fact uh, giving testimony on their own without, without coaching? Uh, and also from the counsel's perspective, uh, if for example, a witness is giving testimony on a very technical element and you need to have an expert's view on what the witness has just said, how do we facilitate communication in that regard? Well, let me deal with the first point you raised. Um, it's possible, I think, and Jason will correct me if I'm wrong, to have a 360 degree camera in the room so you can actually see that there isn't anybody standing in front of the witness holding up a sign saying, this is the correct answer. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it's often the case uh, that the, the party whose witness it is um, will provide somebody independent or the, or the other side can uh, provide someone independent, a local lawyer to sit in the room uh, to make sure that there is no coaching and make sure and certify that the room is empty apart from the witness. So I, d I don't think that is a real problem. I mean, I've heard it mentioned, of course, but I don't think it's a real problem. The combination of having an independent person there, and a 360 degree camera, I think, uh, you know, you'll get caught out if you try anything wrong. I think. Uh, okay, now I guess let's move on to, uh, I mean, we still have the uh, experts issue, I think, which is the second point, which is in terms of expert uh, witnesses, if you need to know what another expert is saying, can we, can we hot tub uh, witnesses or do uh, witness conferencing for expert witnesses online? And maybe this is appropriate for Jason and Kate. So 
so if I've understood correctly, getting the experts into their own uh, environment in order to discuss? Yes, that's, that's right. Um, so uh, in terms of witness conferencing, where we would put the two expert witnesses together uh, and have them you know, basically discuss amongst themselves in front of the tribunal, uh, how do we do that in terms of, say, a video conference or a virtual hearing? Okay. Uh, sorry, Neil, over to you. No, exactly. We have exactly the same if you're cross-examining two people at the same time. Can you get them in the same, the same ability to cross-examine? Okay. Great. Uh, well, I haven't heard the answer yet. <laughs> yeah, so Jason, maybe yeah. if you can help on that. Well, I guess, at least from, from, if I've understood correctly, um, we, we can bring the, the witnesses into the video conference as any other participant in the conference. Um, if, if they need to um, discuss things amongst themselves, then we can certainly arrange that by breaking them out. If they need to have um, discussions in, in the absence of, a, of other participants in the call, we can do the same thing to, 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 to break them out. So. Um, it, it's certainly possible. It might not be as convenient as having everybody in the same room in that regard, but it, it's certainly possible to do that. Uh, for instance, could you cut the screen in half and have one expert on one side of the screen, the other expert on the other, and then either the tribunal or counsel ask a question and they discuss the answer together and see whether they can agree or not? That should yeah, be possible. So, yeah, some systems have the ability to pin um, particular windows to the screen. Um, others don't. So again, it depends on what platform is being is being used. But it, yeah, it's certainly possible to pin particular people in in position. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we I I have a question that I I'd like to pose to Neil, which is, we have proceeded on the basis that parties uh, will have to agree to uh, move from a physical hearing to a virtual hearing. And in many cases, the parties will jointly agree or uh, jointly propose a virtual hearing. What happens if one of the parties objects? So you have one party that wants to proceed with a virtual hearing and one party that does not. Uh, is there any concerns or considerations that the tribunal should take into account? Well, you start off by checking the, the, the local law, make sure that there's no, there's no prohibition against an online hearing. And uh, I've, I haven't come across any, any, any provision that says that. Um, some rules say that if one party wants a physical hearing, then they must have a physical hearing. That's the difference between a physical hearing and a documents only case. I would argue that using this system is the same as an in-person hearing. In other words, it's not a documents only. So I think if provided there's no restriction in the local law, you're okay. Um, now, what do you do if one party wants it and the other party doesn't? Well, to some extent, it depends, I suppose, what the alternative is. If the alternative is, well, we can't get together for another year, and we're giving you this opportunity now to have a, a virtual hearing because we could do it next week, um, and one says, no, we don't want it, then the tribunal has to think about its own duty. And under many systems of law, uh, tribunals are under a duty to proceed with efficiency and dispatch. And um, I think that the tribunal would have every, every reason to say, well, I'm sorry, we're going to give you a, a, a virtual hearing. Uh, the bigger question is, I think, if both parties say they don't want it, uh, has the tribunal got the right to um, go against that joint decision? I think that's more difficult uh, and there would have to be special circumstances, I think, uh, when that would, what might happen. I mean, for instance, if the tribunal said, we can't give you a hearing for two years, but we can give you a virtual hearing next week. And if you don't want it, I'm afraid you're going to have to have it because we have a statutory duty to get on with this and proceed with the dispatch. Uh, that could happen, but it would be a brave tribunal, I think, that does that. All right. Thanks, Neil. I think now we're going to answer some questions or hopefully answer some questions from the participants. We, I see we have quite a few questions, some along the same lines. So I'm going to try and collate some of these into uh, common themes. Uh, we have one, several questions in relation to costs, in relation to whether or not a virtual hearing procedure's fees would be the same as a normal procedure, 
would be there would there be additional costs involved would it be more expensive or less expensive than a physical hearing i believe neil had touched upon this in terms of accommodation and airfare uh, perhaps Jason and Kate can touch a little bit in terms of the uh, actual additional fees that might be incurred. Okay. Um, I, I think the message to convey here is that uh, certainly from our, expect, uh, our experience is that a, a, an online virtual hearing uh, in terms of the, the services that are provided are exactly the same as they would be in an in-person hearing. So therefore the costs would be comparable. Um, to uh, an in-person hearing. I guess the only, the only additional cost that may be incurred is the cost of the moderator or a host uh, to project manage and look after and ensure that the video conference portion of the, um, of the hearing runs smoothly and, and efficiently. Um, so that in the scheme of things, it's a nominal cost. It'll be a daily cost um, and um, it certainly won't blow the cost of the proceeding out just because it's online. And of course, you save, you save on the room rental. <laughs> well, I'm not, sure that's, I'm not sure that's the answer HKIC would like to give, but there's def that's definitely true. Um, you would also save on the room rental uh, in many cases, uh, especially if you're proceeding with a, a fully remote hearing. Um, so there are, there are definitely savings uh, in many different respects. Um, we have one question in relation to the adjustment for a virtual hearing in terms of uh, hearing times. Uh, it's been said that trying to focus and concentrate on a video conference can uh, take a lot more effort than a, uh, a physical hearing. In that case, would it be recommended that we have shorter hearing times when a virtual hearing takes place? Um, I'm not aware that it's uh, more, more difficult in uh, energy how much more time you need for a, a, a hearing of this sort. Uh, but I think that if people do find it a strain, then I think we'd have to have more breaks. Because one of the big problems is the time difference. And if you've got someone sitting in Canada and someone sitting in Hong Kong, you know, one's at nighttime and one's at daytime. So one has to be very flexible about that. And you've got to build in time for food and uh, make sure that people aren't working at a time when they should be sleeping. So one does need flexibility, and that usually leads to shorter hearing dates, days. And, and I think certainly in, in when we've had debriefs with, uh, with some parties, uh, with the parties that, that we've been working with, and the feedback from council has been that they have found it a bit more tiring uh, online than in, than in person. Mm -hmm. So that, that flexibility that Neil talks about is, 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 is important. Well, thank you very much for the questions. We have uh, a lot more uh, questions, but unfortunately, I don't think we have uh, enough time to be able to go through all of them. Uh, the slides in the presentation uh, for today's session will be emailed out and will be found on the HKIAC website uh, after the session. So we have many questions asking for uh, what are very helpful uh, slides for today's uh, webinar. Those will be available on HKIAC's website uh, shortly after today's presentation. Well, thank you again for attending today's webinar. I'd like to extend my uh, sincere thanks to uh, Neil, Jason, and Kate for joining us today on today's webinar. We hope that uh, as participants, you will have learned something new or we may have alleviated some concerns for you in relation to virtual hearings. But uh, we would like to take this opportunity before we leave to talk about upcoming webinars in the HKIC webinar series. Uh, again, the HKIC webinars are provided in three different tracks in Mandarin, Korean, and English. The next English webinar is coming up on the 3rd of June in relation to Korean ISDS case updates, HKIC insights. Until then, we wish you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and have a good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you.